This episode is brought to you with support from BetterHelp. While life has incredible potential for joy, there are also many inevitable challenges. Sometimes we get stuck, and it's hard to overcome the hurdles on our own. At times when you're feeling lost or overwhelmed, getting help from an experienced and knowledgeable professional can make all the difference. Working with a therapist can help in all sorts of ways, from overcoming worry and stress, breaking out of patterns of self-judgment or self-destructive habits, navigating healthy relationships, figuring out how to identify and meet life goals. Therapy is a great way to learn more about yourself and learn positive coping skills. But it can be difficult to figure out how to get started. Finding a therapist near you who's taking new clients and who you connect well with can be a challenge. So if you're looking for an easier way to start therapy, consider BetterHelp. It's convenient, flexible, affordable, and entirely online. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. If you want to live a more empowered life, therapy can help get you there. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Nocturne today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Nocturne. Hub and Spoke. Audio Collective. You're listening to Nocturne. I'm Kent Sparling. You're about to listen to the 100th episode of Nocturne, and this seemed like a good moment for me to step out of the shadows and say a little something about the show. Nocturne grew from ideas and discussions that Vanessa and I had back in December of 2013, and since November of 2014, we've released an episode nearly every month for eight and a half years. I say we because I'm involved in each episode, having created the musical theme and supplying much of the additional music. Sometimes the topics of episodes have been my ideas, and always I do an editorial listen pass for notes before Vanessa is ready to release. In each episode, she's kind enough to credit me as co-creator. But I'd like to dispel an assumption that we hear fairly often. Many people assume that because I'm credited, and Vanessa is the host of the show, that I must do much of the work behind the scenes And they often compliment both of us, or sometimes me alone, for the rich and subtle world of sound design and music that goes into each episode. But the truth is, this is a one-woman show. Vanessa finds her sources and stories, she schedules and records her interviews, she transcribes them, and then she edits the audio. She writes and records all her narration, and works from a bin of music created by myself and others to craft a score that is wholly original. She records and edits sound effects and she mixes and masters each and every episode on her own. It's an incredible achievement, simply for the number of jobs Vanessa handles, but it's all the more impressive because the end result is so beautiful and special. This podcast has a feel, a mood, a voice, and that is 100% Vanessa. She puts her heart into these stories, and every month is working hard to create something honest, original, and beautiful, something that grows out of a genuine curiosity about the night. If you're a long-time listener, or you've just recently discovered us, I'd like to ask you to head over to Patreon and consider supporting Vanessa in this incredible work. That's patreon.com slash nocturne podcast. Fewer than one in a thousand listeners support the show financially, and that may be because it's assumed that there's a team at work or some larger source of resources keeping it all going. But this is a monthly gift, a labor of love, and a beautiful product of one really dedicated and creative individual. I'm so proud to be a part of Nocturne. Thank you, Vanessa, for 100 amazing stories and for all the work that you put in to create them. We can't wait to see what's coming next. When I started making the show in 2014, a show explicitly about night, It felt like I discovered something obvious yet profound. The night is huge and important, and a thing that is so much bigger than the dark hours when most people are sleeping. It's not a footnote or an afterthought. I didn't even have any idea how rich and deep this topic would turn out to be, or that this discovery of the night was part of a growing movement, for lack of a better term. Archaeologist Nancy Gonlin was having a similar awakening. 
When I first approached this subject, archaeology of the night, with archaeologists and with non-archaeologists, nearly all of them said, well, ancient people didn't do anything at night. They were sleeping. It was too dark, right? So that's the first assumption is that they did nothing at night except sleep. But actually, sleep is a cultural activity as much as a biological activity. Yes, we need sleep as human beings to function, but who you sleep with, where you sleep, how you sleep, on what you sleep, when you sleep, all of those have cultural components to them. And even sleep as a topic was something that I looked into because the other assumption is that sleep is a passive thing. We don't necessarily think about where people slept. And a lot of people, even today, sleep on the floors of their houses. But it's hard to find archaeological evidence for that. But if you don't look for it, you're never going to find it either. I'm Dr. Nancy Gonlin. I teach anthropology at Bellevue College in Washington State. And I have a PhD in anthropology from Penn State University, and I specialize in Mesoamerican archaeology, and that's the archaeology of the peoples of Mexico and Central America. Thinking about how ancient Maya people slept, where they slept, when they slept, who they slept with, that's just the tip of the iceberg of a new field of study in archaeology, a focus that up to this point has been mostly overlooked. There's a lot of art and iconography that relates to the night in various cultures, depictions of people doing things at night, and there's also epigraphy. We can, not I personally, we, the royal we, meaning archaeologists who know how to read ancient Mayan glyphs, can tell us that, for example, at the site of Piedras Negras in Guatemala, there was a festival that was held at night, and hot, inebriating chocolate was drank by the participants. And that's all recorded in a panel that was carved of the royal people and his guests imbibing, and it's also in the Mayan glyphs that talk about that event. Dr. Gonlin, I'm going to call her Nancy from here on, spearheaded the archaeology of the night as a distinct field of study, along with associated terminology like nocturnal footprint. It is more or less a term that I coined. And what do you do at night? Do you go out to a bar? Do you spend money? Do you support the local nighttime economy? That's all part of your nocturnal footprint. How did you get there? If you think about your carbon footprint, how much energy do you use? What do you do at night? And what traces does that leave behind? This is my first time interviewing an archaeologist. So I took advantage of the situation to back up for a second and get a little primer about what comprises the study of archaeology. The first thing I learned, I don't know if you know this, is that archaeology is a branch of anthropology. In the United States, anthropology is divided into four fields, archaeology, cultural anthropology, biological anthropology, linguistics, and then a fifth applied anthropology field. And anthropologists study human diversity, whether it's cultural diversity, biological diversity, diversity in the past and the present. So as an archaeologist, you can think of us as being a cultural anthropologist of the past, and we use different methods than an ethnographer would who is interviewing people who are alive today and not so much relying on material remains as we archaeologists who study cultures of the past. There are so many different ways of living, so many different ways of looking at the world. And some of those ways have become extinct. So the goal of archaeology is to understand past cultural diversity and how that connects to the present. And we do that through the material remains that people have left behind. And humans have always left behind stuff. So we as archaeologists try to understand ancient life ways. How did people in the past live? We don't know exactly what they thought, but we can approximate through the material record, art forms, ancient writing, 
to try to understand how people in the past lived and how that's different from today. Studying cultures of the past is not just an abstract theoretical endeavor. For me, beyond an intellectual pursuit and intellectual curiosity, it has everything to do with applicability of today. We study history so it doesn't repeat itself. But also, if we look at the archaeological record, we can see some ancient methods, for example, like in the highlands of Bolivia and how people farmed and how that was very successful and how those methods can be applied to today to increase crop production, to ensure against drought for people. So there's a real practical application to archaeology that most people might not know about. Nancy has co-edited several books on the archaeology of night, the first in 2017 with her colleague April Noel. That book is called Archaeology of the Night, Life After Dark in the Ancient World. And this is a general introduction to the topic, and it's a worldwide collection of articles from different places, from ancient Egypt, for example, ancient Rome, Then we go to sub-Saharan Africa during the Iron Age. We also have authors who wrote about ancient Tiwanaku and ancient Chile, and then ancient Mesoamerican cultures, as well as a few from North America and the Harappan civilization of modern India and Pakistan. So it's a collection that shows the reader that this perspective is applicable to any kind of archaeology, whether classical archaeology like Rome or Egypt, or whether it is more contemporary as one author is an historical archaeologist. Her second volume, co-edited with David Reed, is called Night and Darkness in Ancient Mesoamerica. The third, with Megan Strong, is titled After Dark, The Nocturnal Urban Landscape and Lightscape of Ancient Cities. So if you did a Google search on the archaeology of the night, you'd likely come away with the idea that this is perhaps an established field of study and has been for a while, except that it hasn't. As recently as 2014, this particular focus of archaeology was, please forgive me here, hiding in the shadows. There I was, sitting by the fireplace, relaxing at night, and I had a glass of wine in my hand, and I'm reading a book, and I usually think like an archaeologist. It's not just my profession, but it's how my brain is wired. And... I realized when I was sitting by the fireplace, I don't usually sit here during the day. I don't need the heat of the fireplace or the light of the fireplace, and I don't usually drink wine during the day either. So after a long day at work, there I was relaxing and thinking about the artifacts that I'm using, and I had a wine glass in my hand, and I'm using a different area of my house than I used during the day, and I'm reading about daily practices. What do people do in their everyday life? And then I thought, well, what about nightly practices? How do we understand what people did at night? So I I got up, ran to the computer, and Googled nightly practices. Nothing came up. Archaeology of the night. Nothing came up. Nocturnal archaeology and using all kinds of synonyms to search on the internet for something about archaeology of the night, and nothing came up. The next day I met my friend for lunch, Chris Dixon, and she says, oh, what have you been working on? And I said, what do you think of this idea? And she says, that's fantastic. I've never heard of it. And I emailed my advisor at Penn State, and he says, I've never heard of it. So I started doing more in-depth research and finally got to a point where I realized that this is a new perspective. So I started pursuing it and talking with other archaeologists, and then eventually April Noah and I organized two sessions at professional meetings, and the first volume of the Archaeology of the Night is what came from those two sessions. That was less than 10 years ago, which seems sort of strange to me, that a purposeful view of archaeology through the lens of the night just wasn't a thing before that. Well, it's not unusual for 
people to ignore the obvious. And that's something that any kind of scientist can do. There's something right in front of you, and it's so common that you don't think about it. And so it's not unique in that sense, but there have been bits here and there about what has gone on at night in the past and the evidence for that that I picked up in reading just a voluminous amount of materials, but there was nothing explicitly about the archaeology of the night. So it was out there, but it wasn't formulated into a new perspective. Nancy says there are some simple reasons why night has been somewhat overlooked within archaeology. Well, as humans, we are primates, and our primary sense is sight, vision. And if you think about the fact that we are diurnal creatures, there's no denying that. It's obvious that we would focus on the day. It's one of these obvious things that's so apparent that we just haven't questioned it. And many of us do work at night or into the wee hours, or some of us work the night shift. And this has gone on for centuries, really, for eons that people have been doing that. Not to the extent today, but certainly it existed in the past. And if we think about when is archaeology conducted in the field when we're excavating, we need the daylight to excavate to be able to see what we're doing. So it's no surprise that the focus is on the day and Hilary Orange, she's an archaeologist, says that we're so focused on our work during the day and what people did during the day that the two mesh together and produce decentrism. Nancy says that this decentrism in archaeology can be seen as similar to the long-term failure to study and incorporate gender in the field. And in fact, the person who wrote the afterword for the first edited volume, Meg Conkey, is one of the archaeologists who very much promoted incorporating gender into archaeology because that was a topic or perspective that had been ignored for decades. So if you look at how we think we know what we know, but we don't question what we know, This is one of those things that comes out of that. And as Nancy said regarding the nuanced details of the archaeology of sleep, that is, understanding where, when, and with whom ancient people slept, if you don't look for it, you're likely not to find it. The archaeology of sleep dovetails nicely with another new focus within the field. If you think of living in an ancient city 1,000, 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, and what that would have been like. There's something called sensory archaeology that focuses on recreating the senses that people would have felt, things people would have touched or seen or tasted. And this ties in very easily with archaeology of the night. As night falls, or as night rises, as some uh, nightologists call it, then there are different senses that take over. So if you're picturing yourself living in an ancient city a couple of thousand years ago, and the sun sets, and monstrous beings roam the night, as well as real beings in the form of predators, and you need to go outside, you need to leave your house, your refuge, how are you going to do that? You can't see. You need some kind of lighting device, and you feel your way along the walls. You have traveled this place before, so you know how the path feels underneath your feet. And the air smells different because there are different kinds of blooms occurring at night from flowers that bloom only during the night when the moon comes out. And there's a different taste in the air as well. The frogs are croaking from the stream nearby, and you have insects buzzing about, bothering you as they do today. And in the background, you hear some kind of fox that's screaming because someone is invading its territory. And you're walking along the path, and you're trying to look out to make sure that you don't run into any ghosts or anything like that. 
and your eyes are adjusting and you gradually are able to have a clear picture of what is going on. So if you picture yourself living during the day in an ancient society, that sensation of doing so is going to be radically different at night. These kinds of sensory reconstructions are a newer way of doing archaeology and represent a not entirely uncontroversial direction in the field. For a long time, many archaeologists did not extend themselves in that manner. And processual archaeology, looking at the processes of the past, major ecological processes, was something that dominated our field for decades. And we certainly learned a lot from doing that. But we realized we're missing the human element. So there are more recent perspectives that address that. And not all archaeologists subscribe to, say, cognitive archaeology, trying to figure out what people thought in the past. And I'm kind of in between. I went through grad school in terms of processual archaeology, but I would say that I have also incorporated other theoretical perspectives and tried to broaden my thinking about the past, but still rely on material evidence. It's not as though archaeologists have completely ignored things that people did at night. It's more that by not having a specific nighttime lens through which to view relics from the past, they've been missing an opportunity to capture a whole complete portrait of ancient people's lives. It's kind of like painting a picture and filling in only half the canvas. Nancy wants to see as much of the picture as she can. For me, the main reason is that it allows me to better envision, if you will, how people in the past lived, how they went about their lives, what their lives were like. It gives me a point of comparison, not just during the day, but at night. What do I have in common with people who lived in the past during the night? What are the activities that we did that were similar? What are the differences? So in terms of thinking like an anthropologist and doing broad cultural comparisons, similarities and differences, this is something that really brought out similarities and differences and highlighted particular cultures and their lifestyles for me. When we include the night in our reconstructions, it expands our understanding of people to the 24-hour cycle. And instead of focusing on only, say, 12 hours, there's more or less 12 hours of light in the tropics, 12 hours of night in the tropics, and that's where I do most of my field work, then we can incorporate the full round of activities. There are some activities that would be more appropriate to the night than the day. There's one very famous one, the Aztec or Mexica, and that's the 52-year cycle, and this new fire ceremony took place only at midnight and only on certain dates when the calendars, they had two calendars when those meshed, and this was like the beginning of a new era. You can think of it as kind of like what year 2000 was for us using the Gregorian calendar. To focus on the archaeology of the night, or sensory archaeology, does require a bit more imaginative leaping than, say, looking at the relic of a bowl and hypothesizing more narrowly about its basic daily functions. So if you look at the data that archaeologists already have, I tell my colleagues, you don't need new data to pursue the archaeology of the night. You don't need new data to pursue the archaeology of gender. So, for example, what it mainly involves is what I call a parallax perspective. You need to look at something from a different angle, from a different viewpoint. So if you are looking at these objects that you have uncovered, then think of them in the dark. How would they have been used in the dark? How would these objects that people created help them navigate the night? Because anything that you use during the night 
could probably be used during the day and vice versa. So it has more to do with our perspective on when an object might have been used and also some common sense. So for example, if you would enter someone's house and you would see a light, you can turn it on during the day, but it's more likely that it was used at night. And if you find a bowl as an archeologist that is filled with charcoal, it's possible that was used during the day, but it's more likely that it was used during the night. So there's no reason to assume that that was used only during the day, just as there's no reason to assume that object was used only during the night. Artifacts have lives of their own, and the archeological record is complicated. I wouldn't want to say, for example, that there is one object that was explicitly used only during the night. It's really fun to think about the archaeology of the night and how people in the past lived in the night. And it's an intellectual challenge to be able to recreate ancient nights. And it's just so much fun. It's one of the most creative, fun things I've ever done. It's a subtle shift in a way, this focus on the archaeology of the night. It's a widening of perspective that allows a more comprehensive picture to emerge. Coming back to the activity of sleep again, a whole world takes shape when one challenges the assumption that ancient peoples just closed their eyes and rested when the sun set. The night is actually important for the household economy. And when we think about what ancient people did at night, and if you accept that they weren't all sleeping, then we know that there are many different things that people contributed to that have to do with nighttime activities. So. In terms of household archaeology, which is another field of study that focuses on the remains of houses and the household as the most common unit in a society, then we can see what did people do at night that contributed to the household economy. Obviously, astronomy is one of those things. And astronomy played a heavy role in ancient Mesoamerica in terms of when people would plant when they would harvest. This has everything to do with the phases of the moon. So we know that uh, farming, a very basic subsistence activity, some of that was done at night. And then we know that women in ancient Mesoamerica were weavers, and this was a very important thing, not just making the cloth and the thread to spin it, but also producing finished clothing and blankets that could be very ornate and intricate. And there are some indications that some of that weaving probably took place at night. You don't need a lot of light to do it. And it's something that can be interrupted. And the moon goddess in classic Maya society was the patroness of weavers. So that tells us something about the night. And there's certainly ethnographic evidence to support weaving during the day. I have been to Maya villages where women are weaving during the day, but we don't typically picture them weaving at night when they've got a few moments to themselves. Weaving is a repetitive action that can be relaxing. And once the kids are settled in for the night, then you have a bit of free time perhaps for yourself to do that. The co-edited volumes that Nancy has published on the archaeology of the night bring together examples from ancient peoples all around the world. Included are many relating to practical work and living activities, such as those occurring among the busy streets of ancient Rome. Glenn Story wrote a chapter on all Rome is at my bedside, as he called it. And that's a quote that's taken from Pliny. And he's complaining about how noisy it is at night in Rome because you have these roving bands of gangs that are going to hold up people and rob them. And you have people dodging these carts that are wheeled that are allowed into the city only at night so it's noisy. You have garbage pickup occurring and you have people peeing over the balconies. So it was a very active time at night for the ancient Romans. Nancy finds herself frequently reimagining common activities based on when they would most likely have been performed. If you think of lighting up a huge oven and stoking it and creating a fire that is hot enough to melt 
metals and form them into different objects, then that is best done at night, especially if you are in the tropics as the people who lived in southern Africa during the Iron Age. And there's a metallurgist who is an archaeologist, Shadrach Chirakuri, who is from Zimbabwe, who has extensively excavated at Great Zimbabwe. And based on ethnographic analogies, it would make sense to him that people in the past most likely would have fired up those furnaces at night to do smelting. Another example is irrigation. If you're in the desert of Oman, then it's likely that the evapotranspiration is going to be much greater during the day than if you're going to water your fields at night. So you'll need less water, it will be more productively used for the plants, and your crops will grow better if you do those activities at night. If you have a boat that you're going out on the river or on a lake and you have a torch or there's a full moon, then the fish are attracted to that light. You're more likely to catch more fish at night than you are during the day. A focus on the night can also highlight overlooked similarities between ancient and modern cultures, for example, in issues regarding social inequality. If we think of inequality as existing day and night, how does that manifest at night? So previously I had been describing a feast that occurred at the ancient Maya city of Piedras Negras in Guatemala. And if you think of what would the ruler need to be able to bring this feast to his guests, he would need cooks. He would need servers. He would need people cleaning up. So just as during the day, a ruler would have servants and people of different social status waiting on him or her, then you have this continuing into the night. And today, there are many night shift workers who are poor or do not have the status that they can work during the day. And that is something that also characterizes the past. So inequality is very much transcended into the night. Another way of looking at that is who had enough resources to light up the night? We take electricity for granted today. We don't think about it, but there are people in the world today who still do not have access to electricity, some of the poorest of the world. And that is also true for the past. If you think about who had access to resources to light up the night, candles, how did they make candles? And candles were not used in ancient Mesoamerica, but they were used in other ancient cultures, firewood, who goes out and collects the firewood, who's responsible for getting up in the middle of the night and making sure that the hearth fire does not burn out. It's very unlikely that royal or elite people did those kinds of tasks. They would have had other people waiting on them to do that. This all relates to inequality and power differences. Spiritual and religious ideas and practices are also illuminated through the lens of the night. What we learn about looking at all of those activities through the night is that in many non-Western cultures, there's not a separation between sacred and profane. And many of these activities, especially rituals, have everything to do with the night being the appropriate time to contact ancestors, to contact deities, and so many activities like deer hunting, for example. You need to do rituals before you go out on a hunt, and some of those hunts were done at night. So what this does is it ties in much more closer than before ancient rituals and ancient religion and beliefs to mundane everyday or every night practices. Maya kings would sometimes have their ascension ceremonies at night, where having drawn power from the daytime sun, they could also then draw power from the moon. The nighttime was ideal for rituals because this is when ancestors come out 
And if you were a royal person, this would be the best time to connect with your royal ancestor. So if it's a full moon, this is a great time to come to power. And if you think of an ascension ceremony and how important this would be for the city, for the surrounding community, people could come together in the moonlight and see this. We underestimate the amount of light from the moon because most of us in the U.S. can't see the moonlight at night. Studying ancient people in the context of the night sky offers perhaps a deepened understanding of core differences and how they viewed the world and their place in it compared to people today. Archaeoastronomy or cultural astronomy is when you look from the perspective of how people view the night sky and how that informs us about their culture. Advancements in astronomy, physics, and sciences in general influence how we think about the world today and our place as opposed to our understanding of the universe a thousand years ago or several thousand years ago. But we think that there were many people in the world in the past who knew so much about astronomy, we tend to underestimate their abilities because they didn't have the grand telescopes that we do. And we think about how this impacted their worldview. There are some architectural features. There are entire buildings, a Stonehenge, for example, that's a prime example of how those pillars were oriented toward different major events that happened in the sky. So the sky was part of the cultural landscape as much as the Earth was. Stars really represent the universe way back in time, billions and billions of years ago. It represents creation. And stars tie us to people in the past as well, because when you do see a constellation like the Big Dipper, for example, you know that you're seeing the same constellation that someone who lived thousands of years ago saw. So there's that connection that can be established. But when I ask my students, have you ever seen the Milky Way? Have you seen a night full of stars? Most of them say no. It's very common for us not to look at the night sky because we don't see anything. We see sky glow. The night for many, many different peoples is considered to be sacred. And some of that sacredness has been lost in modern society because we light up our cities so well and we lose that connection. When we lose the vision of the night, when we don't see the stars at night, when we don't feel the kinds of things at night that perhaps people in the past felt, then we're losing part of our humanity because we don't have that connection to who we are and our place in the universe. So the challenge continues, whether in archeology span or astronomy or some combination of the two to acknowledge and preserve the darkness that exists in the world and in our lives, despite the tendency to overlook it or even erase it. When we reclaim the darkness, we are also reclaiming our place in the universe. We are reclaiming time for us to reflect, to contemplate, to think about things that are larger than the daily problems that we face which ultimately is why there are fields of study like archaeology in the first place. We try to understand people in the past to more fully understand ourselves. It helps you to put in perspective who you are and why you're here on this earth. You've been listening to Nocturne. I'm Vanessa Lowe. Nocturne is produced by me and was created by myself and Kent Sparling, who also composed the theme music. Thank you to everyone who supports Nocturne on PayPal and Patreon. Extra big thanks to Aaron Mikulski and Lawrence Stahl, who support us on Patreon at the Happy Possum level. If you listen regularly and don't support the show, I know things are tight for a lot of people right now, 
And if you really can't help out, I totally understand. But if you've been meaning to, or you don't think it will make a difference, please go right now to patreon.com slash nocturne podcast and become a regular supporter for less than the cost of a monthly cup of coffee. And you know you drink a lot more coffee than that. It actually makes a really big difference to me and the show. If you don't want to do Patreon, you can also give a one-time gift at PayPal. Go to nocturnepodcast.org slash support to do that. I'll also post a link for Nancy Gonlin's work on the website in the show notes for this episode. Again, it's nocturnepodcast.org. Nocturne is a proud member of Hub & Spoke Audio Collective, a group of smart, well-crafted, independent podcasts. One of those podcasts is Ministry of Ideas. Ministry of Ideas is dedicated to investigating and illuminating the ideas that shape our society. It's an initiative of Harvard Divinity School, and it's featured in the Boston Globe Ideas section. Find Ministry of Ideas wherever you listen to podcasts, and check out all the other shows in Hub & Spoke at hubspokeaudio.org. Till next time, thanks for listening.